Good evening. Welcome to everybody here for midweek Bible study on this uh, rainy and windy Wednesday night. It's great to be out. If you would, please turn in your songbooks to number 714. 714. We'll be singing the first, second, and fifth verses. <clears throat> When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but his smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt nor a fear, not a sigh nor a tear can abide while we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Pardon the whistle. Let us pray. Our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you this evening, thanking you for this beautiful day that you've provided for us. We thank you for the blessings of this life which you bestow upon us. Father, we thank you for the rain that we've received today. We're certainly in need of it, and we certainly appreciate it and give thanks to you for that. Father, we thank you for this congregation. We ask that you would be with our elders, give them strength and wisdom and knowledge so that they can do the very important job of keeping us safe from the evil one. We ask also, Father, that you would bless our deacons in their separate works that they have here at the congregation. Father, we ask that you would be with the sick of our number be with those who are taking care of them. And Father, if it be your will, bring them back to us, not only in fellowship, but in worship to you. Father, we ask that you would be with the teachers this evening. We ask that you would give them a ready recollection of the things that they have prepared for us and that you would give us an open heart to apply those things to our lives. But most of all, Father, we thank you for the greatest gift of all, the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, 
who came to this earth and who was crucified by evil men, who was raised on the third day, giving us the hope of eternal life in heaven with you, Father. We ask all of these things in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. All right, so we're still in transition between the auditorium and the fellowship room, but here we are today. Uh, little T is stuck at an airport somewhere with a five or six hour delay on his flight, or else he'd have been here for the teen class. That's why uh, you guys are in here. But, uh, and that reminds me, I'm going off to Ohio on wee hours Friday morning for a meeting up there. And it's in a little town, little airport that Allegiant flies to, but Allegiant only flies Friday and Monday. So if I'm doing a Sunday through Wednesday meeting, I'm there Friday to Friday. Oh, yeah. Boy, I forgot about this thing. <laughs> All right. All right. Man, it's been so long since I've seen a cordless mic that worked. I don't know what to do with myself. <laughs> anyway. As we... are in the Revelation... I'd like to remind us of some things about the book of Revelation, first of which, I guess I don't need this anymore, right? Or you can cut it off back there, right? I'll just turn it off and make sure. Um, highly symbolic language is called apocalyptic, and it's full of symbols, and understanding what the symbols represent is key to the book, and so we've talked about that a lot. Uh, it's mostly about what will shortly take place. And so it's going to happen in the lifetime of John or shortly thereafter. Again, because it's written to those seven churches of Asia Minor to encourage them during persecution. And so whatever it means, it must mean something to them first, and then we draw the lessons from it to our age. Now, I had this slide in here. I was expecting a visitor here who didn't show up who might uh, benefit from this. But all that just showing you is, is that, um, oh, yeah, I probably think the, the pointer thing is probably still back over there, but that's all right. But there used to be one over here. All right, anyway, so um, these different views of Revelation, and you get probably no other book in the Bible is more whacked out the way people understand it than maybe the book of Revelation, and uh, so there's all kinds of different views about Revelation, when it was written and all that stuff, and so some take that futurist view, which means everything is future to us, but that would be nothing to them. The preterist view is everything was fulfilled in John's day, but there's still some things that are yet to come. And uh, continuous history means, you know, each age of the church. But the only problem with that is you don't know how far out to go because no one knows when it's going to end. So how are you going to know what to apply to what age? Besides that, it would do John, as John's first readers, very little because the only thing that applies to them would be at the beginning of the book, but they don't know how much of that would apply to them. And then the philosophy of history is just it's an ideal pie-in-the-sky thing that doesn't really mean anything except for just an ideal fantasy type of how God, how we, we ought to be and stuff like that. But number five down there at the bottom, the historical background, uh, that takes this as a real historic events or in the background of it, mostly fulfilled in John's day. And like any other book of the Bible, you know, if we're studying the book of Romans, we'd want to know, well, what did that mean to the original readers of that and then make the application to us? But what we often do with the Bible is we take our perspective, read it back into it, and there you have it. All right, and so uh, we don't want to do that with any book of the Bible, but especially the book of Revelation. Okay, now in chapter 18 <clears throat> is where we are now, chapter 18, Revelation chapter 18. And uh, this, as we mentioned the last couple of weeks, uh, six, uh, let's see, 17, 18, and 19 are kind of going back, and they are fulfilling the purpose that those interludes would do between the sixth seal and the seventh seal, and between the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet, that is, it would kind of bring a, a final judgment to that cycle, and then it would launch us into the next one. Well, in these, these chapters here, uh, the, since the bowls of wrath, which were the last cycle of those seven things, 
uh, the bowls of wrath went straight from six to seven with no interlude in between. But at the end of the seventh, uh, it says that thus were all the, the, the whole wrath of God was poured out on that situation. And so these three chapters are kind of going back after the fact, well, not after, but not, not in the chronological, uh, the order of the chapters. <coughs> it's going back in to explain some things. And the thing he's explaining in chapter 18 is that Babylon the great has fallen. If you notice verses 1 and 2, after these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. And so Babylon is fallen. Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and that's the message of the book here, or this chapter here. Now we've, we're down to, to verse 11, and if you notice uh, in verse 9, verse 9 begins a series of uh, people who are mourning, who are bummed out and lamenting because Babylon has fallen. So he mentions just surveying it, verse 9, kings of the earth who committed fornication, Verse 11, the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn. And notice how many times weep and mourn are in all this. Verse 9, will weep and mourn. Verse 11, the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn. Uh, Verse uh, 15, the merchants of these things, which is talking about the same merchants. But notice at the end of there, weeping and wailing. And I'm reading from the New King James. Verse Verse 19, actually verse 17, in one hour the great riches came to nothing. And then in the middle of verse 17, he talks about uh, merchants of the sea. Every shipmaster and all who travel by ship, sailors, as many as trade on the sea, stood at a distance. And then in verse 19, you have for them weeping and wailing. And so all of that came to a crashing halt. And uh, these ones we're going to read about here when we pick up in verse 11, these are those who benefited from Babylon. Now remember, Babylon is not the literal Babylon. We'll see some things about that in here as well. Because remember, Babylon, um, yeah, this projector is a lot better than that one in there too. So, uh, But literal Babylon is long gone. I mean, you know, Isaiah 14 talked about the destruction of Babylon. It would be like Sodom, not a trace left. And other prophecies about that as well are, are <coughs> all over the place uh, in the Old Testament. And so, uh, but he's talking about it figuratively, symbolically, Babylon represents, as it were, the capital city of opposition to God. Uh, Rome, Jerusalem, all those places you could fit in there as well, but he's using Babylon in this, in this picture here. <coughs> and Babylon is also um, synonymous with the harlot that he talked about in chapter 17, okay? And so when we pick up in verse 11, well, let's just read 9, uh, from 9, the kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, the great city Babylon, the mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. Uh, And that one hour will come again later on, and that one hour is not, again, it's not a literal 60 minutes, but it's a precise point in time that this happened, and of course it's all according to God's plan, and he's still in charge. Verse 11 The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, for no one buys their merchandise anymore. Merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, and scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of most precious wood, bronze, iron, (coughs) and marble, uh, and cinnamon and incense, uh, fragrant oil and frankincense, wine and oil, fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots, and uh, bodies and souls of men. The fruit that your soul longed for has gone from you. All the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you, and you shall find them no more at all. The merchants of those things who became rich by her will stand at a distance for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones, for when in one hour such great riches came to nothing. And then finally, every shipmaster, the, the last group here, all who travel by ship, sailors, and as many as rule, or 
the trade on the sea, stood at a distance, and they cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What is like this great city? They drew threw dust on their heads and cried out, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, the great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth, for in one hour she is made desolate. And then we have another voice, Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. Down through verse 20, okay? And so here, the merchants of the earth, and we mentioned the kings of the earth uh, last time, and here merchants of the earth will mourn, and uh, of course they reap what they sow, and we kind of introduced that theme last week when we were talking about this chapter. And so what they have done to others is now coming back on them. You know, what goes around comes around, we sometimes say. And so, no one wants to buy their merchandise anymore. Now, of course, when we think about it, up to this point, uh, they have, that is, merchants of the earth. And as we mentioned also, of the earth, most of the time in the book of Revelation, is referring to those that belong to Satan. Those of the earth versus those of heaven, okay? Those who have the mark of the beast and worship his image, uh, versus those who, ha who worship uh, the Lamb and have His image, okay? And so there is that contrast throughout the book of Revelation, okay? And so here, these who were of the earth, uh, they forbade those who belong to the Lamb to buy and sell. And I think we did look at those as the bell rang last time, but uh, in Revelation 6 and verse, uh, verse 6, 5 through 6, we have uh, that uh, horseman, the third one, who is... Uh, you know, he has scales, he's, he's on the black horse, and he is holding scales, and there's very inflated prices as he names out, and so that's, that's symbolic of a famine, a famine, and of not being able to eat, which again goes back to, we discussed that way back then, about a year ago, yep, about the, uh, the trade guilds and such, and if you don't worship the god or goddess of the trade guild, you don't get work, and if you don't get work, you can't feed your family. And uh, you may not be allowed in the market. You may not be allowed to exchange money or anything like that unless you worship the beast and have his mark. But now the tables are turned, as it were, and so now they themselves are denied food. They themselves are denied wealth. They themselves are denied what they denied from those who follow the Lamb. All right, now the word merchandise or cargo is used there in verse 11, and it's uh, referring to freight, and it's used... Uh, only three times in the Bible, twice in the book of Revelation, verse 12, and then once in the book of Acts, uh, verse 21, or chapter 21, verse 31. And, uh, you know, that latter part of Acts, there's a lot of ship movement going along as Paul is making his way to Rome. Uh, he'll travel on some ships here and there. All right, uh, but the merchandise listed, yeah, so in verses 12 and 13, he lists uh, a bunch of merchandise. And, of course, uh, I'd like to dig into every single one of these, but I don't have time to do all that. But they're all pretty much self-explanatory. There's a few I pointed out. Citron wood, that was unfamiliar to me. And bodies and souls of men. We'll look at that when we get there. But notice in verse 12, gold and silver. Uh, yes, and again, as we mentioned a couple weeks ago, that um, just like in our world today, uh, there are countries that will form alliances with other countries uh, to see what they can get out of it for them. You know, like, like right now we have all this stuff going on. You have Russia and China kind of aligning, uh, making alliances with each other, maybe under the table. You know, you got Ukraine and, and, and America and all this kind of stuff. And so you got all these kind of alliances going on. And, uh, oh, yeah, in fact, I, was, I heard about this, that uh, Netanyahu from Israel, that he one time he supported Hamas against whoever, and now Hamas has turned on. And, uh, of course, that stuff happens all the time. And we once supported the, uh, you know, in Afghanistan. Who was it? I almost said BLM, but it wasn't them. But it was some, yeah, there you go. All those guys, and, and they turn on us. And so, and we turn on others. Uh, at least in their eyes we do, and that's just the way it is sometimes, okay? Shouldn't be that way, but that's the way it is. And so, so these merchants, they were tied into Babylon. They were tied into Rome. They were tied into that wealth, and they provided them something. Rome gave them lots of wealth. And so they had it made for a long time. They were riding that bandwagon. Oh, yeah, it's kind of like, you know, you know, who would have heard, who would have thought of Amazon, like, you know, 20 years ago? I could care less because I didn't like to read books anyway. You know, huh, man. But now, man, if you're in, if you're in on Amazon, if you got a contract, a trucking contract with those guys or a shipping contract with those guys, 
you're kind of like, you're very busy. I, I might say rolling in the dough, but I don't know if that, that might be an exaggeration because you still got to keep up your equipment, but you got it made. Well, now suppose Amazon crashes, which it might one day, you know. But just think of all the people. All these warehouses popping up all over the place, man, all over the place. And so if Amazon crashes, all these people can be out of a job. Uh, no food, no nothing. And so that's the kind of thing you have going on here. All right, but gold and silver, precious stones, pearls, fine linen. And, uh, you know, linen and clothing, we don't think of it that much maybe in our day and age because it's so readily available. But that was a, a treasure. You know, laying up yourselves treasures on the earth where moth and rust does corrupt. There's not a whole lot. Well, I guess there might be an heirloom maybe, but so far as monetary wealth, there's not a whole lot that a moth can eat up in our wealth, okay? Now, it might eat up an heirloom or something like that, but, um, and then also when, um, when uh, Hezekiah showed the, the, that envoy from Babylon all his arms and all that, in that was mentioned garments as well, because that was, a, that was a treasure. All right, purple, silk, scarlet, every kind of citron wood, all right? Now, citron wood, um, uh, the King James thiine wood, scented wood, the ESV there has, and it was a very costly wood that had a very unique grain pattern. Uh, the pattern, um, what represented, it kind of looked like the eyes of a peacock's tail or the stripes of a tiger and the spots of a panther in the same grain. Uh, a fellow by the name of Cicero, uh, Cicero in about AD, or no, uh, 50 BC, and I forgot who he was, a historian or some, I think he was actually an, an influencer of his time. Okay, there you go. <laughs> uh, I think he just said he was a statesman or something like that. Anyway, but uh, anyway, he, he reportedly paid enough for a table that was made of this wood that would have purchased a large estate, it says there, okay? And so the trees was prized for its, for its beauty, okay? And so that's Chittim wood, and then he goes on. Uh, every kind of object of ivory, carvings and all of that, every kind of object of most precious wood, uh, stones, or yeah, wood, bronze, iron, and marble, cinnamon and incense, fragrant oil and frankincense, wine and oil, fine flour, wheat, and again, these would be the normal, <coughs> the normal cargo they would, they would ship in, cattle, sheep, horses, chariots, and then at the end there, bodies and souls of men. All right, now, bodies and souls of men are referring to slaves, and uh, notice it's the very last thing there where some commentators have observed that it was the lowest, you know, the, the, the least cared for, the least, um, you know, treated the worst or whatever. Uh, on that it comes after all those animals and, and so forth. Um, but notice uh, the, the phrase bodies and souls. Now, uh, one source says that referring to humans as bodies is from a Greek background in which, quote, slaves were regarded merely as bodies, end quote, while souls comes from a Hebrew background and, quote, stands for the lives, souls of men. Uh, and um, the combination, um, bodies and souls of men, refers to one category, and that is human slaves. And we'll look at some passages here in a moment. Uh, notice there's a, there's a similar, well, there's a passage in 1 Timothy 1.10. If you look over in 1 Timothy 1.10, which is also a reference to slavery, but notice how it's given over here, 1 Timothy 1 verse 10. And uh, here he's writing, um, if you go up to verse 9, knowing this, that the law is, is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate for the ungodly and for sinners and for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers. And we're going to come back to that. Kidnappers, that's it. For liars, for perjurers. And if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. But that word, word kidnappers. Um, the King James has men stealers. All right? ESV has enslavers, all right? And it comes from a word that means kidnapper or slave dealer, all right? And so you had that going on. And, of course, we've mentioned from time to time, you know, biblical slavery 
The New Testament particularly wasn't quite exactly like, you know, the antebellum period in our country, although there were some similarities to that, but it wasn't exactly like that. Um, I don't know if I've ever given that lesson here or not on that. I have to go back and look, but I have a whole lesson on that. But anyway, <coughs> um, you know, there were a lot of things like slaves, you know, most slaves could expect it to be freed uh, by the time they were 30, 35, something like that. Uh, there were different ways people could be slaves. They could uh, be captured in war and stuff like that, and that would be the kind that would be more like our um, antebellum slavery in our country. But they could also, you know, in, in debt themselves, if they owed a debt, they could in, you know, voluntarily enslave themselves. And the Bible will usually translate that a bond servant, one who voluntarily enslaves himself to pay off a debt. And then, um, you know, again, you might be enslaved for uh, born, born, you know, you were born and your parents were slaves, something like that. So there's about three or four different ways a person could become a slave then. But like I say, most of the time, most slaves, I've been told in reading sources, uh, could expect to be freed. Uh, slaves could own property back, back in that day as well. And they were, you know, the more educated, the more value they were. Uh, whereas over here, a lot, of, a lot of people didn't want them educated. But over there, it was a different story. And over there, you couldn't tell a slave by looking, at, by looking at him, okay? His skin color didn't mean a thing so far as slavery. Now, sometimes if he's working and stuff the way, you know, he might have work clothes on where everybody else doesn't, that might be an indication. But for the most part, they all, they, everybody looked, looked the same. It was kind of a eclectic society anyway. Let me tell you, the first time I went to Ghana, West Africa, in the market, it reminded me of one of those Star Wars, you know, where they're going through the junkyard, and all these different people are speaking different languages, and this group speaks that language, this group speaks this language. Some guy over here knows this language, but the other guys don't. And it's just, just, just like that. But so far as appearance goes, in fact, at one point, um, you know, you've seen... There's different stats as to how much of the Roman population were slaves or, or ex-slaves, anywhere from two-thirds maybe, at least half to two-thirds. I've seen different as to how many of the population were slaves. But you couldn't tell just by looking at them, okay? And so, um, you know, there was a, a time in Rome's history where the, uh, you know, the, arist the, the higher-ups would wear the purple on their toga, their dress toga, you know, to show that they were the higher-ups. And so there was one fellow that, that thought it, that they should uh, make the slaves identify themselves by their clothing. But as the Senate talked about, they said, no way, Jose, because if all these people knew who else was slaves, they'd get together and do an uprising. So we'll just leave it like it is, you know. Uh, but that just illustrates you couldn't tell just by looking at them uh, what that was, okay. Uh, but <clears throat> slaves and souls of men here was part of the cargo that they would carry. And so... Um, we have that, all right? And then, but the rest of that, uh, you know, is just stuff that we've read about before, and so we see that in the cargo, okay? All right, but the point is, is all that cargo that they used to ship, they used to get rich off of, is no longer there. It's gone. In fact, he says, well, we don't, haven't got down to verse 14 yet, but in verse uh, 13, well, verse 14, yeah, the fruit that you're so long for has gone from you, and all the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you, and you shall not, uh, you shall not find them any more. Okay. Now, um, the fruit, uh, fruit here is, um, yeah, that's not the usual word for fruit, and this word fruit only occurs here in the whole New Testament, and it refers to the summer fruit that is ripe and juicy, and it's ready for making a profit. You know, in other words, and so he uses that word fruit. Um, yeah, because in our, the way we ship our fruit and stuff, uh, yeah, you know, whoo, uh, yeah, you know, I've been, I've been, 1996, I first came to work with the school, that's a long time ago, and a lot of things have changed generally in culture and stuff, you know, and so there's this guy that used to drive a banana truck for Publix, and he was telling me back then how they would bring him in all in green, they'd pull him into this big old building about like this, shut the doors, inject gas, and that would ripen them up. I don't think they do that anymore. Uh, I don't know what they do now, but these bananas, they can be green and still get age spots on them, and you peel them now, and there's all that stringy stuff is all over the place, man. I don't know what's going on. But I'm sure the process has changed. Um, but I say all that to say that, you know, when, in, in this culture, you know, they didn't have, you know, you could dry fruit and that kind of thing, but fresh, juicy fruit, you had to pretty much 
pick it and ship it, pick it and ship it. And fruit like that would be somewhat rarer and be more, more value. And so it's, it's used here to refer to all that stuff that they used to make, make a killing off of. It's gone now. It's gone. All right. Um, they long for that thing. And the word gone there means never. It's departed, never to return. And uh, they will not want any part of the city. Notice again, just like the kings of the earth, the merchants in verse 15 who became rich by her will stand at a distance for fear of her torment. And notice weeping and wailing. And so they don't want to go near that destroyed city lest they get caught up in that and they get destroyed too. Uh, at least they have their lives even though they don't have their livelihood. <clears throat> and so they want to keep a distance from that. Uh, and so again, gone from you forever. It says again in the second part there. And then uh, keeping their distance, the torment, uh, keeping their distance of the torment. And we've looked at that word before. And that word means mental and spiritual torture or torment. And it's used uh, several times in the book of Revelation. And uh, of all these weeping and wailings and stuff in here, uh, it occurs, there's six different words, where there's six words, there's three of those that are different. Uh, uh, weep and weep is the same. Uh, weeping, but you have wailing and uh, mourning are different. You have weep and lament, weep and mourn, and weep and wailing again, and weeping and wailing. So four times you have those two pairs uh, but they're different, different Greek words. Uh, there's about three different words in those eight times. All right, um, and so that fruit is gone forever. All right, notice also they will want no part of that ruined city. They keep a distance. They lament. Notice in verses, um, well, the, the, that word lament is uh, throughout there. But in verse 17, notice, for in one hour such great riches came to nothing. And so again, it came to nothing in one hour at a precise time, all according to God's timing. All right, um, let me, well, actually, this is a new section here, so any questions on those merchants, those merchants, all right? And notice here, the merchants of the sea will mourn, and notice he gives four categories of that, shipmaster, and some of the translations will have captain for that, some of those other translations will have um, navigator, pilot, uh, that word right there, uh, various words like that. And uh, it's used again in Acts 27, 11, and that is where, oh yeah, where Paul is on that ship, uh, there's a storm, and I forget how the New King James translates it, I think it might translate it, the helmsman, the helmsman uh, did not, <coughs> or he wanted to go, <coughs> even though there was a storm that Paul told him about, he wanted to go, Paul advised against it, uh, but the Lord told Paul that everything would be all right. Uh, but he went, and I, and I, I think, uh, let me see, Acts 27, 11, it's the same Greek word, but um, I believe it's translated helmsman or something like that. Okay, and so, um, <clears throat> and I read one source that said they don't know exactly where that word came from, exactly what it means, but, you know, he's a head honcho of a ship. I don't know if he's the top person or whatever. Yeah, the pilot, yeah, okay, <laughs> yeah. There you go. Oh, yeah, in that one. Yeah, in that one. Yep, okay. Pilot and captain. Okay, there you go. And, of course, um, their nautical setup was a little bit different than ours, I'm sure. All right, notice all that travel by sea. The New American Standard has every passenger. ESV says seafaring men. And then you have sailors, and sailors are mentioned again in Acts 27. <coughs> and those who trade on the sea, or ESV has there, make their living by the sea. And that'd be all the support businesses, you know. I don't know if they had sandwich shops back then. I don't think so, because some Duke of Earl, or no, Duke of Sandwich, or whatever his name is, at Disney Springs, uh, he's the one that invented the sandwich, and it's way, way after that. All right, but anyway, uh, all those businesses that, that were connected with the sea and made their living, and so all those guys are going to be mourning. They lamented, and so there is a kind of a pattern each of these. They lament, they stay their distance, because they don't wanna, want that to happen to them. All right, so they shout in disbelief. Uh, here, verses 18 and 19, they cried out uh, when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, what is like this great city? And they threw dust on their heads. Well, what is it like this great city? Now, the ESV has what city was like the great city. And the idea here is who would have thought this could have happened to Babylon? 
And, um, you know, I mentioned Amazon a while back, but remember old Sears, man. Who would have thought back in the 60s, 70s, even the 80s, maybe 80s, I don't know, that Sears would get bought out by Kmart? Are you kidding me? Kmart? <laughs> and then they both would fold, okay? Um, but, you know, that's, that's battling. How, how, who would have ever thought this could happen, but yet it happened? All right, and uh, let's look at Ezekiel 27. I meant to look at some passages like that earlier. But Ezekiel 27, and uh, we have in a, lot, a lot of it in Ezekiel 27, because in this section of Ezekiel, he is condemning the nations, okay? And in this section, he is condemning Tyre and Sidon, which Tyre and Sidon were on that coast up there by Mount Carmel that stuck out. And uh, they were also called the Phoenicians. And I remember a long, long time ago when Epcot first opened, 1984, I think. I don't know, it might have, could have been 82. Uh, they had that big golf ball thing where, I forget what they called it back then, but it's like the history of mankind or whatever. And they had a scene where you went by and they talked about the, the Phoenicians were the first great shipping people, you know, and they showed them, you know, a little map of the Mediterranean, which is like the Bible lands, you know, and them shipping out off to Spain and all that stuff. And uh, that's who Tyre and Sidon uh, is, all right? But in Ezekiel 27, 30, uh, they will make their voice heard uh, because of you. Uh, they will cry bitterly. The you there is Tyre. If you go, verse 25, the ships of Tarshish were carriers of your merchandise. And so he's talking about the same type of thing here. Verse uh, 28, well, 27, uh, actually 30, verse 30, they will make their voice heard because of you. They will cry bitterly and cast dust on their heads. They will roll about in ashes. They will shave themselves completely, bald because of you. And these are all signs of mourning, signs of lamenting. Gird themselves with sackcloth and weep for, your, for you with bitterness of heart and bitter wailing. In their wailing for you, they will take up a lamentation and lament for you what city is like Tyre, destroyed in the midst of the sea. And that what city is like Tyre, similar to this, what city was like that great city, okay? And so you have the same terminology, talking about the same type of thing. And of course, putting dust on your head was a sign of mourning, sign of lamentation. All right, now here's a quote that's uh, of interest here. Uh, John applies to Babylon what Ezekiel directed against Tyre, all right? But Babylon was not a seaport, you know, it's way up there uh, on the edge of the desert. Uh, neither was Rome. You know, Rome was kind of in the middle there of that Italy. It wasn't a seaport, although it had some that it relied upon. And so another, this is another indication that this is not literal, okay? Uh, it is not John's intent to describe any one city, but the great harlot city, the archetype of evil, Okay. And so Babylon, again, is not being literal, but it's just a capital city, if you will, of opposition to God as John writes this, all right? Uh, and, of course, we have cities, you know, uh, like Las Vegas is known as what sometimes? Sin City. Uh, I forget what New Orleans. I guess New Orleans is the big easy, but it would be like Sin City Junior probably. I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> um, but anyway, all right? Uh, and then heaven can rejoice. Notice in verse 20. Uh, of Ezekiel 18, verse 20, uh, rejoice over her, O heaven, and you, and now the King James says, you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. And so here rejoicing is appropriate, all right, so God's servants who were persecuted rejoice. And uh, the other translations beside the King James family, uh, they have three, they have saints, apostles, and prophets. And I don't see a light on here. What is L-A-N, land? That's not a light, is it? No. Oh, I might have broke something. Okay, anyway. Um, but anyway, so at issue here is uh, what's called a textual variant. We've talked about these before. Five minutes. The bell just rang. Five-minute bell, okay? Uh, we've talked about these textual variants before, and... Um, oh. Anyway, so we've talked about these textual variants before. And so uh, you have a word here that means 
uh, holy, singular, but when it's in the plural, it's usually translated saints. But notice you have, and this is like English and Greek, kai oi, kai oi, and then kai oi, you have and the ones or the and, you know, whatever. All right, and so uh, what's happened, and this can be verified in manuscripts, uh, some scribe way back in the day accidentally left that out, and then when people copied his, you get more like that, but uh, ones that are discovered before that, you know, they, they have it like that, okay? But anyway, so if you leave that out, then you have this modifying this, and this is the word holy or holy plural, and this is the word apostle plural, and so you have it modifying as an adjective, the holy apostles, okay? Uh, and then you have and the prophets, all right? But with this in here, you know, it's, it's a separate, distinct list. You know, and these ones, and these ones, and these ones, okay? And uh, we just talked about this kind of stuff at the end of the Greek class today about textual variants and manuscript errors and all that stuff. And I have a list of about probably 12 or 13 of them. And uh, when I first came to preaching school in 1989, I uh, lived about three blocks that way, two or three blocks that way, off of Maxwell, Banks Place, all right in there. David knows exactly where it is, uh, former mail, mail carrier, but anyway. Um, and uh, so uh, back then, you know, we didn't have computers, and I would handwrite all these notes, and I'd take them to my wife, and usually that's that very night, unless it was a Wednesday night or something, she'd type them up all nice and neat on a typewriter. She, she was good at that. And uh, even though I did my best not to make mistakes, I did my best to, you know, circle things with different color pen and point it over here, this goes here, that. And I guarantee you she did her best to get it exactly like I had it on that piece of paper, but guess what? You still make mistakes, okay? Uh, and every single one of those 12 or 13 ones listed I have, I have seen before, okay? And I have experienced before uh, with all that handwritten stuff, all right? And so that's that's... You know, it's not a liberal versus conservative thing. It's a, you know, what does the evidence say? What does the evidence say? And so that's why the newer translations will have uh, three things there, the saints, the apostles, and prophets. But then the old King James and the new King James is based on the same Greek text, will have holy apostles and prophets, okay? And, and again, uh, you know, the manuscripts that the King James was based on are much, well, later, you know, they're, 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 they're further away. Like, like if this is where the apostles lived and wrote the original New Testament books, uh, and the first century is right here, uh, the manuscripts that the King James is like over here. But in the late 1800s, a bunch, bunch were discovered that date back here, you know, uh, sh shortly after the apostles. And, uh, and so these would, generally speaking, be more accurate because the further away you get from the original, the more likely, you know, human error is going to creep in. Now, again, the inspired manuscripts from God, the original autograph books of the Bible are perfect, infallible, you know, nothing at all wrong with them at all. But the problem comes in when men enter in and they start having to hand copy these things. And remember, Christianity doesn't become legal till 325. And so much of the copying was done in a dark corner under the radar out of sight from the officials, sometimes by not even members of the church, but people who could write, you know, and so they would, they would write these and copy them, and so you do have manuscript errors do creep in, but the amazing thing is, out of all the manuscripts we have, now when I was a student in 1989, the number that the textbooks always gave was we have 5,000 pieces of evidence to testify to the New Testament. Now it's 6,000 pieces of evidence. Uh, in my, my Google News Feed sometimes, I'll have an article in there about some discovery from the second century A.D. that has Scripture quoted on it, you know. Well, anytime you have Scripture quoted, that tells you that there had to be an original, right? And then now that becomes a piece of evidence to compare it with manuscripts and other pieces to see if it fits or whatever. And so it's just a fascinating study. But again, it's, it's tried to get at, you know, what did the original say? What, how did it actually read? And we have to put some stuff together on that sometimes. All right? But anyway, so when we come here in verse 20, uh, for God has avenged you on her. And so God has avenged um, this. All right? Now, this rejoicing, 
before the bell rings, this is not an expression of glee over the fall of a great city or people, but a rejoicing over the defeat of evil and the victory of righteousness. The church has been avenged upon great, uh, upon great enemy. Uh, the world and justice has been fully rendered to that great destroyer of mankind. And there might be supposed to be upon a great enemy there. I might have to have the word A in there. All right, but that quote comes from Homer Haley. And uh, God has avenged the violent persecution of his people. And so he has fulfilled a principle here. And look at Jeremiah. We'll close with Jeremiah. Jeremiah 51, 49. We'll close with that. And notice the similarity to what Re uh, John wrote in Revelation 51, 49. Uh, Jeremiah says... Uh, as Babylon has caused the slain of Israel to fall, so at Babylon the slain of all the earth shall fall. You who have escaped the sword, get away, do not stand still, remember the Lord afar off, and let Jerusalem come to your mind. And that's at the end of uh, Jeremiah, after Jerusalem has been destroyed. All right, that's it for tonight. Appreciate your attention. Let's pray. Gracious God and loving Father, we thank you for this time and this, chance, this opportunity we've had to study from the book of Revelation. <clears throat> In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Song of Invitation is number 454, 454. Uh, we're glad that you're here tonight, and we are still adjusting with the construction and all that, so we appreciate your continued patience. Uh, it's good to, good to be back in here for class, and I'm sure it's good to be in the fellowship room for Rick's class, and uh, got a little bit more elbow room, and so that's good. Uh, Fran Gabbleton will be having further tests at Moffitt, and will have surgery in a few weeks. Uh, Patty Van Allen is still not feeling well. Uh, Stacy Wil uh, Wilson is in LH or Lakeland Regional Health. And he has high blood pressure and AFib, and I guess that's still current, right? All right, uh, also the elders would like to meet with, with each family at South Florida Avenue, and we're available on the third Sundays 
or any other Sunday for that matter, but we've kind of chosen this third Sundays to be for that. But if, that, if you can only meet us some other time, that'd be, that'd be fine too. We can work it out. Uh, area-wide announcements. There'll be a Ladies' Day at the Kissimmee Church of Christ on Saturday, April 6th, in just a few days. Stephanie Kenyon will be one of the speakers, and so contact the office if you would like a ride. Uh, there will be a Church of Christ homeschool educator retreat at Orange Street Church of Christ on April 26th through 27th. Please register by April 6th if you plan to attend. The Eagle Lake Church of Christ will be having two events back-to-back. -back. On Saturday, April 20th, uh, Pamela Clark will do a, gospel, or a Ladies' Day, and then on Sunday through Wednesday, Sunday beginning April 21st through Wednesday, her husband Jimmy Clark will be preaching in a gospel meeting at Eagle Lake Church of Christ. And then the Griffin Road Church of Christ will have an annual lectureship coming up on Saturday, April 27th. Uh, Rick Kenyon will be one of the speakers. And it begins at 9 a.m. and lunch will be provided. Uh, the senior saints also will be taking the church van to Webster Flea Market on Monday, April 8th. Uh, they will be leaving the building at 8.30 a.m. And so if you'd like to go with that, please feel free. Uh, contact Steve Waddy or let the office know. And so please check the bulletin for extended family. If you're not on the email list, it also has announcements as well as other people who need prayer, uh, let the office know. We'd be happy to put you on that. And again, the invitation song will be number 454. Well, I didn't mention on here that Bobby Shoemaker is not feeling well, and so uh, we'll add him to the sick list. I also will be going. Josh and I will be leaving on Friday to go to Ohio uh, for a gospel meeting, and so we won't be here Sunday or Wednesday, but the next Sunday we should be here. All right. Okay, uh, so I'm doing the invitation for Bobby tonight. If you have your Bibles, I want to take a look at Mark chapter 10, Mark chapter 10, and um, I just had it right here. Yes, in chapter 10, verse 13, and they brought little children to him that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked those who brought them. When Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, Let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. And I never noticed this next verse um, in the other Gospels, but you know how sometimes you read something and it doesn't really hit you like it did today, but notice, Assuredly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God, as this little child, will by no means enter it. And what really took me here was, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God, as this little child. Now, Jesus is a lot of things personified. You know, I am the resurrection and the life. Uh, the hour's coming and now is when all are in their graves. Uh, you know, the worship, you know, the, the hour's coming when they shall neither worship in Jerusalem nor on that mountain, but uh, he'll go on and talk about worship. And so he's a personification of a lot of things, but he's also a personification of the kingdom of God. Uh, if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the kingdom. Um, I think when he, when he cast out the demons of which he was accused of uh, blasphemy, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, he said, you know, that that was proof that the kingdom of God has come to you, that he drove out those demons. And this is in Matthew chapter 12, uh, verse 26 or 22 through 36, the whole context there. Uh, and so he is the kingdom of God. And we do know that the kingdom of God is the church, Matthew chapter uh, 16, verses 18 and 19. Upon this rock I'll build my church, the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto you, Peter, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, that whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And so the church and the kingdom are one and the same. The church is the body of Christ. You can't have a body without a head. You can't have a head without a body. And so the church and kingdom are one and the same, and they are the body of Christ. You cannot separate Christ from his body. Remember when uh, the Lord appeared to Saul of Tarsus on the Damascus Road? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? But just a few verses up, it said he was wreaking havoc on the church. 
Well, you, the church and the, the Christ are one, inseparable. And so there are a lot of people today who want to have Jesus, but not the church. They want to have Jesus, but not his kingdom. Give me the man, not the plan, or whatever. But it's impossible to have that. And as Jesus says here, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as this little child cannot be in it. And so we cannot be in Christ's kingdom unless we receive it. And to receive the kingdom, we have to receive Jesus and his word and what he tells us we must do to be saved and to be added to the church and thus part of his kingdom. And he tells us in the New Testament that we have to believe that he is the Christ, John 8, 24. We have to repent of our sins, Luke 13, 3. We have to confess our faith in him, Romans 10, 10. We have to be baptized into Christ, Romans 6, 3, and 4. We rise to walk in newness of life. We're, we're, we're added by the Lord to his church, Acts 2, 47. And we are part of the kingdom. Uh, Colossians 1, verse 13 and 14, that Paul there writes that he has translated us from the, 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 the power of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. In, in uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace and reverence that we may approach God with reverence and godly fear. And so if they were receiving the kingdom back in the, and when Hebrews was written, uh, the kingdom is here. And so, uh, and then in Revelation, of course, chapter 1, verse 9, John is on the Isle of Patmos, and he's, he's, a, he's, he's with them. He's in the kingdom and in the tribulation uh, with them as he writes that. And so the kingdom was a part of the first century because it is the church. And so tonight, when we look at ourselves, you know, where, where's my standing in relation to God? in relation to Christ, in relation to my sin? Have I been saved from my sin through obedience to the gospel? If not, we have an opportunity to do that tonight. And uh, that's the only way we can be part of his kingdom. It's the only way we can have our sins forgiven and to be added to the church is through obedience to the gospel. And so if you've done that in the past but have not been living as you should, in uh, 1 Thessalonians 2.12, uh, Paul says that we need to walk according to the kingdom, that we, our walk must be according to the kingdom, which means we must live according to what Christ, how Christ wants us to live. And so if you are subject this evening to the Lord's invitation, uh, don't let another moment go by without responding. As we stand and sing this invitation. What can wash away my sin?
for the Jesus to bring it to us. So, Father, as we go outside these doors, we pray that you protect us as we go home. But ultimately, Father, we thank you. We're all as it were always named for a member or had a member 2,000 years ago. And we pray that we continue to be beacons of light in a dark world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.